Hey there, welcome back to the new video. So for this video, we'll do a walkthrough of the last year's EM NLP paper, which is titled as Zero Short Cross Lingual Sentence Simplification. This is from researchers from University of Edinburgh and University of Zurich. So let's start off by understanding the title first. As we can clearly see, there are a couple of keywords like zero short, cross lingual, and sentence simplification that we need to understand first before we delve more into the paper. Cool. So sentence simplification is nothing, but as the name suggests, you're trying to simplify a sentence that is now easier to read compared to its previous version. So for example, if you have a sentence S, which was in, let's say, Shakespearean language. Now you have another version of the sentence, let's call it as S2, which is a more simplified and easy to read format of the same sentence. So this is the task of sentence simplification. Okay, so now talking about zero shot, which I would say is a problem set up under which during the inference time, your model is given the samples or observations that it has never encountered during the training phase. So if I take an example, let's say, you train a model on let's say three classes of let's say rats, horses, and fish. You train your let's say CNN model on this, but during inference, you observe one more example, which is of let's say goats. So then your model is supposed to correctly classify that image under the respective class. So yeah, that's about zero shot. Now talking about cross-lingual, the hint again for this is there in the name. Cross-lingual is like you're trying to train a model on one language and generalize it on other language. So if you now sum up the entire title, we are trying to do sentence simplification by training a model that generalizes on multiple languages under the constraint that those different languages on which we are trying to generalize don't have any sentence simplification parallel data. So which means let's say you have a high resource language H and let's say some low resource language L. So you have a parallel corpus of sentence simplification for this high resource language. So you're trying to train a model on this setting and generalize it on a different language altogether where you don't have any sentence simplification parallel corpus. So yeah, that's the entire task. So with this background, let's move forward and see the method. So when comparing to the previous work, such as this one, where the approach that researchers took for doing zero short cross lingual sentence simplification was that if you find a complex sentence in the low resource language, the first step is to translate into the high resource language. So that is the first thing. And then since you have a representation of that sentence in high resource language, we expect to already have a model that does sentence simplification in that high resource language. So with that, you get a simplified version of that sentence. And then you again back translate it to the original language. So that is the third step. So if you visualize this process, let's say this is a high resource language that we have, let's call it as H, and this is the low resource language that we have. We get a complex sentence, let's call it as C1 in this low resource language. So the first task that the authors did was to translate into a high resource language and let's call it as C1H. So which means you need a model that does this translation from L to H. And since we are in the space of high resource language, we expect to have a model, let's call it as M, that will take a complex sentence and give out its simplified version. Let's call it as H1C. And once we have the simplified version, we apply another model that translates it back from high resource to low resource. And finally, we'll get a simplified version of the same sentence. So if you notice, we need essentially one model for doing this translation, another model for doing the vice versa of that, and the third model, which is the sentence simplification. So clearly now the sentence has to pass through three models where each of them might add their own noise. So yeah, this is the pictorial representation for the thing that we just read. Okay, so moving back to the paper. So clearly there are multiple hops that are happening in this entire process, which eventually is adding to latency and the noise. Whereas the work that the authors propose in this paper is just a one hop version of the same task, where I guess they make use of the sequence to sequence model. Yeah, they use encoder decoder architecture and train it in a multitask setting. So let's talk about first what encoder decoder generally is. So in this, you have two stack of layers. One is called the encoder stack. Another is called the decoder stack. And each of them could have a multiple repeated block units of any combination of layers. So for example, if you talk about the transformer unit, you have the self attention, you have the bash normalization, then you have fully connected and so on. So that's like one of the units and that can be repeated again and again to create a very deep encoder architecture. And similar thing goes with the decoder. So let's say X is what we have as input, which is of let's say capital N words. We input all of these things to the encoder. And at the decoder, we expect to get its dense representation for each of the words that we have entered during the input segment. And then you also get a final representation of the entire sequence, which goes to the decoder end. And let's say if this was the task of translation, 
then you clearly don't require these individual outputs. You get the embedding representation of the entire sequence and at the output end, you start decoding one word at a time by feeding in the previous word that it generated. So yeah, this is the main idea to how encoder decoder architecture essentially works. So let's see a little formal way to how they have written. So let's say we have a source sentence X, which is defined as this, these are the number of tokens. And then we want to kind of predict a sequence of Y's, which is given as this. So since it's a sequence to sequence task, you can kind of model many tasks in such fashion, which could be, let's say translation, or maybe just take simplification from complex English to simple English, which is again the main purpose of this paper. So they adopt to the transformer, multi-layer, multi-headed attention architecture. And the representation of the input after any ith layer is given by this. So if you have x as input, you pass it through all n layers. xn is the output representation of that input sentence. And just like any other task in sequence to sequence, you try to minimize the cross entropy loss. So for example, for every token that you generate in the y sequence, based on the model parameters and the input sequence representation, and also the words that you have generated for the sequence y, what should be the next word? So you'll have one hot representation for the actual word. Based on that, you calculate the cross entropy loss and then you back propagate to update these weights. So yeah, that's pretty standard. Okay. So authors essentially use this encoder decoder architecture and train it in a multitask setting where they define four basic tasks, which are translation, auto encoding, language modeling, and text simplification. So then depending on the source and target language, which could be high resource or low resource, and also the output domain, which can be simple or complex, you format every training instance and then pass it through the model. So if you see this table, we have three major tasks. One is translate, then language model, and then simplification. So the task of auto encoding also is kind of is put under the hat of translate. So let's talk about the target domain first. So wherein a simple domain would mean your data is acquired from the source that was easy to read and comprehend. For example, one of the sources that authors mentioned is simple Wikipedia. So that's a simplified version of the original Wikipedia what you see. And the complex domain is where the text is not explicitly written for the ease of reading. So that's how you kind of define these targets. So let's understand the first row. For the task of translate, if the source was a high resource language, wherein for this paper they mention it as English, and the target language was also high resource language, which again is English. So this setting is particularly an example of autoencoder. And to create a target sentence for such setting, they replace some of the words from this input sentence with the keyword drop. And that is what you need to predict on the output end. And the target domain is complex because it was not taken from that simple Wikipedia stuff. You had some other data that was pretty complex compared to that. So yeah, that's about the first row. Now, if you go back and think about the intuition to what this particular task is adding in terms of the information to the entire encoder stack, could be that you're trying to learn the language structure by correcting in the noise that might be present in the source language. And also the notion of target domain is helping it to understand the difference between how a complex sentence might look like and how a simple sentence might look like in terms of its vocabulary, in terms of its construct and so on. And similarly, if you see the second row, you're doing the same stuff for low resource and low resource, but this time for the simpler version of the language. But now if you see this row, you are again performing a translate operation where the source language is nothing but English, which is high resource and the target language is German, which is low resource. So this clearly is a translation task because you have languages that are different. So in this paper, they also go under this assumption that you have this monolingual translation data available. So this is the second task. Then you have the language modeling task where clearly you don't have a pair of source or target language. So you just deal with one of the languages, which could be high resource or low resource for that matter, and try to train a model against the target domain of complex and simple. Where again, the plain idea of language model is that the decoder essentially learns to predict one token at a time with the aim to maximize the likelihood of what it generates. So this task also allows you to incorporate the monolingual because you are just dealing with one language, language constructs. And then finally, the main task, which is simplify. And since we are under the assumption that the simplification corpus of parallel sentences is just there for the high resource language. So that is a clear task that you train. These are the four tasks on which they essentially train and kind of augment every input sample under this setting and do the training. 
So let's move forward to the architecture and understand it better. So this is the model architecture. As we can see, there are two bifurcations of this architecture. One is the task specific segment, another is the shared segment. So we start off with the source language S. We encode the word units in that sentence, pass through the set of transformers layer. Here they have chosen it to be six, which in the paper they have said it as K, which again is a hyperparameter that you can tune. Now for every mini batch, they decide the task that has to be done, the domain and the output language. So every batch is supposed to be annotated with these three settings based on which you decide which all switches to kind of activate and calculate the loss for. So all these dashed arrows that you see are optionals that will be triggered only when that particular task is called for and similarly for the domain and decoder. So if we see this table again. So let's talk about an example where a mini batch is sampled for this first row where you want to do a translation task from high resource to high resource and that too of complex domain. Okay, so now coming back to the figure. So the input was high resource, which means we are talking about English. At least for this paper, they have mentioned high resource to be English and low resource to be German. We convert the words of that sentence into IDs and pass it through the transformer layer. And since our task is to do the translation, we go through this direction. Now this becomes the bold line post which our domain was also complex. So we go under this direction. And finally, since our output domain is also of high resource, which means of English. So finally, this is a path that we choose. Then at this point, we calculate the cross entropy loss back propagate to adjust all of these weights. A similar process repeats for another batch with another setting of T, D and O. So yeah, that's about how we train it. So with this, you must have gotten the intuition like this shared architecture of this transformer layer is supposed to learn generic embeddings that could serve all these three tasks in parallel. But if you notice, they are still having a dependency on the input source language. So to tackle that and to convert these shared level embeddings into more generic format that doesn't also depend on the source and target language, they introduce another loss, which they refer to as adversarial loss. We'll come to that as we proceed forward. But before that, let's understand the equation for this visual explanation. Now task is a set of these three elements wherein for input X, you first pass it through the K layers of the shared encoder post which for every task you pass it through one is to T, which is T level of that particular task. Then the output from that task specific encoders, you pass it through D layers of either simple or complex domain. So this is now the final representation that you get out of the encoder, in it, which includes the shared part as well as the task specific part after which, which you calculate the cross entropy loss, which again is the similar thing. The model parameters are theta. Xn is the representation that we just saw. Then, then we have already defined the domain task and the output language till a certain point. I, we have already generated the Y for us. Then what should be the I plus one at position of this Y. And we keep decoding it till the length of that Y is reached. So yeah, that's how we calculate the cross entropy. Okay. So now talking about the adversarial loss that I had talked about earlier, they train two feed forward networks, which act as a discriminator to this model. So you can think of again in the GAN terminologies, you have something that's generating certain thing and the discriminator who is trying to kind of classify it correctly. So with that adversarial setting, both of the systems try to optimize the best of themselves. So here again, the one of the discriminators is essentially working on the input sample X when passed through all the base layers, which are of K depth, the aim of this model is to now determine the source language. Whereas the second discriminator model that they train is at the final output of the encoder, when it passes through all the N layers, which includes the shared as well as the task specific layers. And the aim of that model is to predict the target language. So the better these discriminators are in predicting the input language and the target language, the more loss they'll incur for which now the encoder will try to update its parameters so that for the next iteration, these discriminators are not able to classify it correctly. And eventually in this entire process, the representation that the encoder is going to learn will be agnostic of the target language as well as the source language. So yeah, if you see the equation, so this is the parameter for the network that's trying to classify the input language. This is a parameter for the network that's trying to classify the output language. You pass the input through the base K layers, do the classification, calculate the cross entropy against the actual language. And similarly for the other discriminator, you pass the input through all the N layers, do the classification, you have the actual label, 
you calculate the binary cross entropy. And finally, you parameterize this by lambda and add it to the original cross entropy loss. This is now the final loss that you want to optimize. Now, clearly, if you set this value to zero, you're just playing around with the cross entropy loss and you're essentially not forcing the representations to be agnostic of the output and the input language. Whereas setting this lambda value to be really high might even downgrade the performance of the encoder representation that you learn because this might even force to not learn even necessary information that was required at the language semantics and structure level for input and output. So yeah. Okay. Okay. So the final part. Now, what do you do during the inference time? Now, considering this model is now trained. Now, during inference time, you get a sentence from low resource language that you need to simplify. You pass it through the shared encoder part, go through the simplify transformer layer, go through the simple domain layer, and then choose your language specific decoder, which could be German in this case. So yeah, that way you can kind of traverse through the network and get the prediction for what's required. Okay. So yeah, I think now we're done with the paper. Cool. If you like such content, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to share it across with your friends to whosoever is interested in such content. I'll meet you in the next one. Bye-bye and take care.